We are here talking with uh, with Mike Bowling. Thank you very much for for joining us. Thanks today. for having me. And uh, we're excited to get into talking about the the Atari benchmark and the story behind that. But before we start, just very briefly, who's Mike? Um, I guess I can. Uh, there's a lot I could say to that, but maybe I'll respond from the academic side. Uh, I have been a professor here at the University of Alberta for 20 years, uh, and I work in the area of reinforcement learning. So this is the problem of how do we get uh, computers and machines to actually achieve goals, where they learn to achieve the goals themselves rather than being programmed in how they, what behavior would achieve those goals. And ideally, I'd like to see that happen where the machines, just like we do, uh, try things out to figure that out. They have experience in the world is primarily what they're learning from to achieve those goals. Um, I've done uh, work uh, where I test our ideas out both within games. Uh, we're going to talk about Atari, Atari more. That's one of the games I've used before. I've also done a lot of work in poker, a game where you don't have all the information you need to make the decision uh, that you need to make because, of course, you would love to know your opponent's cards and you don't have it. And uh, while we've done a lot in these sort of classical games where AI has made a lot of advances in things like chess and Go, poker was a longstanding problem where it, it differed from those games where you don't have all the information. In a game like chess, the pieces on the board is all that mattered and everyone got to see them. Uh, and here we're missing that. So what kind of new techniques do we need to handle this very realistic setting where we don't have all the information? And, and why was that an area that particularly interests you that you wanted to, to look into? I think a lot of my interest uh, early on was thinking about situations where there are other decision makers in the world with you so that I'm trying to achieve some sort of goal but like it naturally matters that that you know there are other two people here that are, are uh, you know maybe helping me achieve that goal or maybe making it harder for me to achieve that goal or maybe just going about their own goals themselves and how does that change the learning problem and um, I would say a lot of reinforcement learning at the time hadn't really made much progress in that question Poker was a really good place to think about that you have to reason not just about what should you do in light of someone else is trying to bluff you off your hand, uh, say, but also how, like, what what is their decision-making process and can I influence it and how I make decisions? And that felt to me, like, really at the heart of, like, really intelligent behavior. And I couldn't think of a better place to sort of test that out on than uh, to look at poker. Okay. Yeah, that's... I mean, I guess when you play poker, you might not think of it, but there's a lot of uncertainty, a lot of, um, I guess, having to guess what others might be doing. Yeah. And and a big part of uh, a poker is about reasoning about that. If you just even think about, you know, you're dealt two cards, like, you know, if you might see that you have a pair of aces, you might think, oh, this is really good. I'm going to win a lot of money. But like, that's not entirely clear. Like it matters what cards of the other player has. And a after betting has occurred, like, have you already given away that you have aces? Because if the, your opponent knows you have a pair of aces, then you're not going to win as much money if they think that you have really low cards at that point. And so, like, even how to think about your hand actually depends on both uncertainty of what future cards are going to be revealed, because you don't know that, but it also depends on what do other players know about what your hand, what do you know about their hands? And I think that's really at the heart of playing that game well, and that was what we wanted to build systems that could actually uh, reason about and play well in. And that also seems like the kind of thing that that those methods can translate into some of the things that we might want to see reinforcement do in a non-poker setting. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, ultimately the goal, of course, is, is not really to build poker playing programs, although there are people that are excited about that possibility and it has actually influenced people training against poker playing programs as a way to get their game better. So there is an element where there are, there is interest in that, but that was never really the goal. The goal was this is a test bed. This is a place that we can try out ideas really efficiently we can benchmark them against other ideas by having them play against those other ideas and you know a head-to-head -head competition and we can make rapid progress at understanding about how machines might reason about other other decision makers in the world one of the things you're known for is the atari benchmark can you tell us what that is yeah um the atari benchmark is uh i'm going all the way back to 1977 when the atari vcs uh or the atari 2600 as it was called uh, was released, and this was the first video game console that you could buy, and that you could then separately buy games for, that you could buy a cartridge and plug it in if you were old enough to remember the days where you put cartridges into into gaming consoles. Uh, and so this was hugely popular when it came out in the 70s. Of course, we're now talking about it, uh, you know, over 30 years later. Um, and so uh, what is it? It is, I want to take uh, all of the games, ideally, that has been made for the Atari 2600, 
and say, can we build agents that could learn to play all of those games without knowing about each individual one, without having to program it to play or think about what's going on in each individual one. It would just sit down and play through these games and be able to play all of them at, say, you know, a human competent level. We were always seeking with the benchmark to try to achieve competency. We just wanted, you know, unlike chess, where the goal was to beat the world's greatest player, here the goal was, can you just have an, a program that could learn to play all these games from scratch, just with its own experience, to play at a, a competent level? And so that was what the benchmark was. It was as we're developing more uh, uh, powerful reinforcement learning algorithms, here is a suite of, of 50 different environments that you could go run on and see how well your algorithm runs across a wide variety of environments. So how does that compare to poker? Um, there's a couple of, uh, there's, a, there's a number of reasons why they're almost orthogonal. Like this research, uh, like it, while both of them are about how do you learn to make decisions in these complicated environments, they're quite a bit different. So, so poker always involves more than one player. Uh, there were Atari games at the time, and, and maybe people have fond memories of playing against their, their siblings at some of these games. The way we were approaching this was to take them only the single player games. We were taking the games like Pitfall and Montezuma's Revenge, and uh, and so on. Uh, these were the games that you played against the, the 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 computer and tried to see how far you could get in the game or whether you could beat it. So these were single player games as opposed to multiplayer games. They both have a sense where you don't have all the information that you need. Uh, in poker, it's mediated slightly differently because the other there's another player in the game that has that information, and that matters uh, quite a bit about how you understand that uncertainty. The last point that I would say is that uh, Atari represents visual inputs. So it's a much more natural way that you might interact with it. In poker, you could imagine we would do poker programs by having a camera, like sitting around looking at the table and trying to look at your cards, but that wasn't how that manifests itself. Just like we don't do that with chess. We we handed a, a sort of description, a concise description of the poker hand uh, to the program. Whereas with Atari, we wanted it to learn straight from, from visual inputs the same way we would. It would have to learn to identify that that little dot is like a bullet and you know you pressed a button and it caused the dot to come out of your thing that is roughly looks like a spaceship uh and I, the, they the, the the system the computer would have to figure that out in order to achieve its goal of trying to increase its score yeah so this is kind of a cool idea how did that idea come to you yeah so um it's interesting it it, it started in barbados of all places well, okay so uh, why were you in <laughs> barbados <laughs> Um, that is another story, but uh, uh, McGill University has uh, has a research center uh, in Barbados where they use that um, to host uh, a variety of workshops, and they had been hosting a series annually of reinforcement learning workshops. So, looking at this this problem, how do we build systems uh, that can that can learn on their own to achieve goals? Uh, so, you know, through a series of I was attending these workshops uh, in successive years, and um, Carlos Diuk, who was a uh, postdoctoral fellow at the time, uh, presented uh, some new results that, that he had on Pitfall. In particular, looking at if we handed our systems uh, descriptions of where objects were in the world and what the relations were instead of like the observation of like, here's a bunch of pixels, uh, you could build systems that could learn much more effectively and with that representation. And uh, super cool work. Uh, I think it was really inspiring. And, they dem and he demonstrated on the game of Pitfall. And so got to show videos of, of agents playing Pitfall, which, of course, you know, enraptured everyone's attention more so than watching like a dot walk around a maze. I, I think the other point to say is that what was happening in reinforcement learning at the time, you have to look at how were advances being demonstrated? How was research happening? And most research was happening in a very particular way that you, you'd have some new idea and you would go to the benchmarks we had at the time were very, very simplistic. Uh, we would have little mazes, sometimes called grid worlds. We would have um, maybe something called mountain car. If you're in the field, you know this. Basically, if you had an underpowered car, and you, how would you get it up a hill? Uh, there are very, very simple problems. Uh, and then invariably that, of course, we always aspired to something more. So, so as a researcher, you would then go find some other problem that was harder than people had been doing. And you would show results on that problem, showing you were sort of capable of making that advance. But we didn't have we didn't have the capacity to share code as well as we do now and what it meant was that most people couldn't replicate the results so there were you know at the time there was all kinds of results on things like riding a bicycle or controlling an octopus arm or these various challenge problems but you would never see more than each paper was mazes uh mountain car and then some other domain that no one else ran on and so we had no real way of knowing how to compare like what was actually happening in the field so um 
the combination of that being the background of where we were, plus watching Carlos Duke's talk, you know, I was just immediately starting to think of, you know, Carlos was avoiding the question of how would we do this from pixels? And A, I was like, no, that's the question. How would we do this from pixels? And two, to really demonstrate that, like, what if you could show it across all the games? So this sort of percolated in my head, and that night, not uncommonly, there would be like a walk down the beach of Barbados. Uh, this this retreat place is, is directly on the beach. So we walked down to a beach bar. Uh, Mark Belmare was there. I want to say Aaron Talvity was there. And obviously Carlos was there. And that was when it was, what if we had an agent that could just play all the games? And it, you would, and, and, then, and then a lot started to change from that. It was like, well, we could even solve other challenges to doing benchmarking in RL, which one of the problems is you're, you're kind of measuring not just how good your algorithm is, but how good is the practitioner at applying the algorithm to the problem. Whenever, whenever, whenever you had a test, there was that being measured as well too, because you had these questions of say representation. So Carlos was coming on saying, we should represent the, the spaces, the problem as having objects and their relationship to each other. Um, you, you always had to have that step because when you came up with a new environment, you had to decide how to represent the environment to the agent. The thing about Atari is we could have all the games could agree on that representation. The representation is I will hand you the video image that you're going to get from time step to time step. And the actions you're going to take has to be, well, you have to control a joystick. There are 18 possible, nine possible directions you can move it and you can press the fire button or not. Uh, so now everything has the same agreed upon interface. And that same agent could then be used to run on many things. And so we took maybe the, the practitioner out of the loop so we wouldn't have to be testing that as well too. Many of these algorithms have parameters about how fast they learn, how they learn. There was also a methodology that came out of this that, and I, I, this was talked about right there on the beach bar that you could have training games. You could say, I want to have, I want to learn to play in these games. And then I'm going to measure your performance in 40 games that you've never seen before. And that was unheard of, right? Like no one in reinforcement learning was thinking that it was always, you know, I iterated on trying to get my algorithm to work in this game. And then I report the results as opposed to how would it work in a domain that you haven't seen before. And of course, that's the that's the real question we want to get to. We want to have an algorithm that, with a new problem we haven't seen before, is good on that problem too. And Atari gave us a way to think about that. So, so pretty much most of the ideas of what we wanted this benchmark to be happened around maybe a small amount of drinking and waves crashing on the beach. So it sounds like we should make sure that you get to walk on the beaches of Barbados as I much as possible. I wouldn't disagree with that. Yeah. yeah, it sounds like a great plan. <laughs> so after Barbados, yeah, what did you do? Um, got a master student. Uh. Yeah, you know, as as any good academic does, you know, they come up with an idea, then they don't do it. They get someone else to. Um, so I had a master student named Yavar Nadef, uh, who was, you know, the problem was, okay, how would we do this? Like, we're going to need to to hook into a very old 1977 console, which is, of course, mostly out of the question. Like, you know, that isn't going to be a way to do research. Isn't we're all going to buy uh, mostly broken uh, consoles that are available and are now hugely expensive on eBay. Right. Um, uh, but at the time there were emulation, emulation happening where we could run that exact hardware, uh, on our modern computers and it would emulate as if it was occurring inside of, uh, inside of that original hardware. This has two advantages. Um, one, uh, important one is of course we could run it. We had access to it and everyone could run it on their computers. Right. The second advantage is there is largely no reason then, since our modern computers are much faster, that we can't turn up the speed and make everything run really fast. I'll say in a minute while, while that's important, but, um, but there are some challenges too, because these emulators had existed, but why did they exist? They existed because, you know, people my age had a lot of nostalgia for playing Space Invaders or Miss Pac-Man, and uh, they wanted to play these games now. Uh, so they were designed to allow you to, you know, use your mouse or a keyboard, or if you did want to plug a joystick into it, you could go buy a replica Atari joystick and to play the games. Um, but we wanted to hook it into, well, we don't need to display anything on the screen. I need to take that image and give it to another computer program that's going to process that image and then produce an action. So I don't need any of the monitor and I don't need any of the joystick input. I need to short circuit that and feed it off to an agent. So, so the emulators did exist. Uh, we built it on something called Stella, which was an amazing piece of programming because 1970s hardware was had a lot of stuff you had to do analog. And here were people taking that analog stuff that was happening and make it run digitally so we could emulate it. So kudos to the developers of Stella. We wouldn't be able to do anything without their original work. But basically we took that and started lopping off 
all of the display side of it and said, no, 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 we're going to feed this off into an agent that can learn. Yeah, and it was kind of like a very well-timed, right? Because those emulators had been built up and were ready to go. Yeah, and there was, you know, there's still some some challenges to that in, the, in regards to uh, the way the Atari 2600 worked. You directly had to control, essentially, the beam. Like, you know, if you go back to non-modern TVs of how they work, they literally, like, had an electron beam that scanned up and down the image. Uh, the actual hardware was actually having to almost essentially turn on and off that beam to draw things on the screen, which meant that how do you fill the buffer of the image to hand to somebody? And so so the emulation was having to emulate all of that, but we wanted to cut off the sort of display part of this. Uh, there, there's a lot of trickiness uh, in the sort of technical side that you've are handled to be able to both be able to get that input and and provide that output but uh provide the output from the the agent controls but also then how to speed this up so then how do we make it so that we could have an agent that could learn in an hour as if it had seen a week had played this game just over and over and over again for a week uh you know why do we want to do that well because we want to do a lot of experiments right we want to try out lots of different ideas and if you can come up with an idea and get a result on uh 50 games in a day or a week, instead of say, no, no, I'm going to have this train over a year to figure out how to play these games, then we can have more ideas and try out more ideas. So making it go fast and cutting off all of that, uh, the visual processing was was a big deal. And did you were you looking for feedback about the idea early on? Actually, so, so yes and no. I was running around giving a lot of talks on Atari very early on. I. I had this very well polished. Uh, let me tell you about how amazing it would be if we use this as a benchmark. But I must admit that I wasn't. I, I guess I wasn't dreaming big enough after seeing what happened. Uh, I was really just hoping that our papers would get accepted. Like I honestly thought that what was going to happen was we would submit papers where we showed algorithms, where we demonstrated them mostly through Atari games, and that this peer review process would look at it and say, "Well, that's great. You tried it on one problem, but you should try it on more problems." Whereas you know, like my view of this was, no, no, I tried it on 50 problems. Uh, and so I, I wanted to try to help educate the community to, to really just get our, let our papers have a, a chance of getting in. Um, but I, I guess I was effective. Uh, it wasn't long before there was probably a dozen research groups around the world that were, like I remember sitting down with a you know a very good uh, colleague of, of mine, uh, Joelle, and she was saying, wow, you know, working in Atari is hard. And I was like, you're working in Atari? Um, so it was exciting. It was, it was pretty exciting to see other people seeing what I saw in it. Um, but originally I wasn't really trying to change how we did RL research. I was, I just wanted to do RL research with this and wanted other people to accept that as, uh, as worthy research. And so, so it was kind of a surprise how, how it caught on then? Uh -huh, I mean, a hundred percent. Like e even after seeing, okay, great research groups are working on it. I mean, there was a point, you know, four years later where I'm sitting in uh, NURIP's workshop on deep reinforcement learning, and half of the talks, over half the talks have Atari results in them. There's a workshop with a thousand people sitting in it. When I started in this field, NURIPS didn't have a thousand attendees. And now here's a workshop of NURIPS with a thousand people in it. And half the half the talks have uh, Atari results in it. And Montezuma's Revenge is like a, a household name in the field. And this is an obscure Atari game that... Uh, yeah, that uh, was mostly un, you know, would, was was not in anyone's zeitgeist uh, before this. But it's gonna be a good feeling, though, right? Like a little bit. Oh yeah, definitely. I think there's two good feelings about it. One is to just see that happen, see that that chance to have an impact, not in the way that I necessarily intended, but then also to see see how it's changed the field and helped it. It's been really important, I think, to push the generality of reinforcement learning in a way that had been pushed before. I think it also pushed, we really can um, work directly with visual input, where that was largely just not done in reinforcement learning up until that point. So you might not have actually been going out seeking feedback, but it sounds like you, you probably got some. So can you talk a little bit about what kind of things you were hearing? Probably the first talk I gave was naturally within our own department. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the one of the first people to hear what the ambition was and what we wanted to, to achieve was Rich, Rich Sutton, being often described as the father of reinforcement learning uh, and, and certainly wrote the book on reinforcement learning as a more, more factual statement. You know, he was very, very clear from the very beginning this was a bad idea. 
Um, now, I think, I'll say, I'll say in a minute uh, that he was right, but he was also wrong. And I think he, I think he also truly appreciates what Atari and that benchmark did to allow reinforcement learning to move in a, in a, in a direction and further than it had been able to reach before. But, um, you know, what, what did he see? He really saw it, I think, as the danger being you have simplified RL, advancing the field of RL to being make one number bigger than another number. And that's going to latch on. I think he saw, he saw what I didn't see. I was trying to get my papers published and he saw, he actually saw what that future would look like that this was going to catch on and people were going to use this and benchmark their work on it. And they were just going to care that this number was bigger than this other number. And really good ideas that someone might do some research on for which maybe Atari isn't the best benchmark to illustrate those ideas are going to have trouble getting attention because they don't have Atari results to show that their number is bigger than some other number. And uh, he, he said that right in the first time he heard it. He said that it's going to be hard to publish really good reinforcement learning results that don't have it, that can't be shown in Atari. And there was a period of time for a couple of years where people literally got reviews saying, you don't have Atari results. Like, I don't know what to make of this. I, you know, and papers being rejected on those grounds. And, you know, that was not, you know, that wasn't the outcome that, you know, I wanted. That was the outcome I think that was the best for the field. I think that peer I think I think we moved past that period of time, but like there was a it got so much attention that it meant that if you weren't doing this, it was hard for you to make progress. And I think I think Rich saw that. And then I think it also enabled less than our best science as a community because here was one number. And if you could just make that number higher, someone could say, Great, that's worthy of a paper. Uh when again, you know, just like I said, our we're not we're not trying to build programs that play poker. We're not trying to build programs to play Atari. That's not that's not like the end goal of any of this. The end goal is to understand how computers could achieve goals in the world through their experience. And uh, Atari is a way to benchmark that, but it's not the end all be all. But it starts to like when a benchmark catches on like that, it becomes you better have results that beat the other people's numbers. And uh, if you beat the other people's numbers, then we're automatically good. And neither of those things are are good. Neither of those things mean that science is advanced because of what's been. And was that an issue with the Atari benchmark specifically, or is that kind of inherent in any sort of benchmark? That... Oh, I think I think it's probably inherent. To a degree, it's inherent in any benchmark. I think there's something Atari was a little bit different in that it was so viscerally, you could see your agent doing cool things that maybe had a, a little bit more of an attraction point to it, that it it definitely maybe took on a little bit more of, this really is the problem we're trying to tackle when it still wasn't. Um, so I, th I think maybe that, that, that extra fact that like you could easily make videos of your research and show them and those videos themselves could be compelling. Yeah, a little pitfall guy bouncing around. That's right, just know. hopping over the alligator's mouths and jumping on vines and it looks so wow that I, I, think, it's, I think it was a little bit more than just, you know, um, you know, other benchmarks like classifying, you know, handwritten digits, uh, maybe doesn't give you that feeling that this is really smart. <laughs> and we've all had the, like, ex well, not all of us, but many have had the experience of playing a new game and it being difficult and then having to go through that exact process. Whereas, like, reading handwritten digits, you probably don't remember when you had to learn <laughs> how to read handwritten digits. So it's sort of like a different experience, maybe one that's more. That's right. And especially when you watch, like, uh, one of the things that, again, over time, Atari challenged, challenged us in different ways. So, so some of the problems of Atari didn't, some of the games in Atari, they didn't just amend themselves to us being successful on them. Some of them took longer before we could have RL algorithms that could could do well on those. And a lot of those were typically called these hard exploration problems is what they got the name for. And I think I, I think they also viscerally, from a human point of view, you could see, you could understand the difficulty the agents were having with them because it involved this sort of long-term sequence of actions of not knowing how things interacting together. And I think those are exactly the experience that, that I think you're imagining is like, I sat down to play a video game. What am I supposed to be doing here? And you could watch the agents also not know what they were supposed to be doing there. And I don't know if it was something you were thinking about, but the, you're kind of touching on this, that 
the Atari benchmark has this wonderful sort of accessibility and also very visual nature. Was that something that was sort of serendipitous? Was it? I don't think it, I don't think it was serendipitous, but I also don't want to give myself too much credit for it. I think I am attracted just as much as the public might be to this is accessible. I am also attracted to things that are accessible. And I just thought that would be cool as I think, literally as I think my 12 year old brain was thinking that would be cool. And so I, I don't I don't think I was was positioning this to be the factor in why this is this might be successful. I think it was just my 12 year old brain saying that would be pretty cool. That's you know, one of the things I dreamed of doing would be systems that could learn to play games that I've always been playing. Um, and so I think that was maybe a side effect of of be, me being drawn to those kinds of problems. So speaking of 12 year old brains, I, I remember something about your kids playing Atari. Yeah, in that first presentation, the, the well-polished presentation, one of the things I would show, I, I really wish I would have done a little bit more on this, but uh, when my kids were five, I want to say, I should be able to get the exact year right. They might have been six. They might have been six. We sort of had the first connection and built in place. We had some very early agents, but I wanted to try to illustrate how, how difficult this was. Um, and so I had uh, my twins, um, which makes me feel like I could have done a controlled trial study here, but whatever. <laughs> um, uh, I had them uh, essentially play through uh, the Atari games um, in an unusual way. They, they basically got to play a game uh, until they ran out of lives, uh, and then it would just switch to another game. So they 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 got to sort of experience. You don't get to spend. You're not spending a lot of time on any one game. You could just you just sort of jump to the next one and the next and the next one. And so I recorded this in both audio and video uh, of them playing through and uh i use that to illustrate why is this challenging um so like i have a video of my six-year-old playing ice hockey where he was super excited about how well he was winning 20 to nothing but he never did realize during the entirety of the game that he was controlling the other team oh. um <laughs> i think we've all been there <laughs> It's so funny because, you, you know, you push the joystick in a direction toward the goal and even press the button to shoot. And, you know, it's a good opportunity to shoot. So the computer is also shooting. So, like, it's it's not maybe surprising that it's not obvious to figure out who's under your control. Um, we actually use that. There was a whole, because of that observation, there was a whole research paper in. Uh, we had this paper on contingency awareness of could you identify which pixels uh, in an image is under your control and if you knew that, would that help you then learn how to achieve the task? Um, and we saw actually pretty big performance improvements from making that a prediction problem. What what pixels on the screen under your control? And then use that to drive uh, feature representation. And that came from watching uh, my my children play video games. So, did you ever tell him, like like if he listens think, to this, is that how he's going to figure out? Um, he, he has heard that story before. Uh, he, he's seen a later version of that talk. Uh, so, so, so he had heard, um, I didn't tell him at the time, uh, I was, cause I was, it was very hard to watch them play and not, I mean, both, you know, I was, I'm not, an, I'm not a human experimentist person. So like, I'm, I'm not used to like figure out how you set this up where you're not going to inject experimenter bias. But, like, also, they're my children. So, like, you know, you're watching them struggle on something. You just want to sit there and say, you know, your job is to go do that. It was already hard enough to just try to keep my mouth shut. But Although it is pretty cool that if your dad comes to you and says, I need you to play video games for science. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. It's every kid's dream. So we talked a little bit about, like, you got some positive feedback, some negative feedback. How did that shape the way that you approach things from that point forward? Well, we we thought we had... A lot of, like, you know, there there was uh, in the original. So, so eventually this comes to a point of, you know, I'm giving talks even before this paper comes out, but we put a paper out that is, that is basically describing, here's the benchmark, not only just how you interact with it, but it, it did more than that. And I think um, I think it's important what it what it tried to do. And, it, and a little bit of, of this sort of your question about how do we navigate the positive and negative feedback matters in this. It's not just here's a test bed that you can run. It's not just, hey, Atari games, and everyone could go running as Atari games. It was more of like, how should you use this to do research? That was an important part that we saw. I think it wasn't just, here's an emulator. You should use this in reinforcement learning. It was, here's how you should use it. And this was things like, we established, first of all, that uh, you know that you're going to take images directly. We're going to be handing you images. That's the, the mode of 
of how you operate with this. There was also a secondary alternative, which you could take the, the, the actual vector of memory of the machine was another option. Turns out the old, you know, this is the 70s. We had very small, small machines. The, the vector of memory was only 1,000 bits. It was 128 bytes. So 1,000 zeros and ones described the entire state of a game. Um, that's all the memory it had. So, so that was another thing you could operate on. But we sort of established exactly what the interface was so that everyone had to agree on that. Um, another factor that we, we established was, or tried to establish, was that there was going to be training games and there was test games. So we, when we showed some initial results, which we provided sort of like, here's some baselines that you can that people can do, say, like, can I get better than this? So here's standard algorithms and here's how well they do. We showed how you would use a small number of games to tune those algorithms, and then you would evaluate them on, you know, these 45 other non, the, the evaluation games. Another factor is, you know, you're going to now get 45 different numbers. How do you try to look at them? Like, maybe I do better on one game, but this other algorithm does better, you know, does worse on that game, but better on this other game. So how do you interpret all of those results? So we gave a, a mechanism by which you can sort of see Get a single graph that could show you the picture of how things are working. That was what that was what I think. I still think that was at least half of what was important in that paper, and a lot of that was dictated on these conversations of what people thought. Like, how do we do this? If there's bad outcomes. How do we shield ourselves from those bad outcomes? Um, but then you know the world does whatever the world wants to do, and and you know saw Atari games. Um, and they didn't see this careful, laid out experimental methodology necessarily. Uh, and that is, so largely speaking, you know, testing training games, that Atari games caught on, but testing training games, that, that didn't catch on. Uh, the community struggled to figure out how to interpret all of these results. I think every once in a while you saw a paper that would go back and almost try to reinvent, uh, what we showed in that original paper, but you could tell how closely they read the entirety of the paper and that, that, that. I, I think the way of thinking about that is catching on even more now, but that's like almost 10 years later. So the first thing we realized was as much as you can tell people what you should do with this, they will do what what they want to with it. Um, yeah, which was a little bit hard to take. Uh, the result of that was five years later. Uh, so the original Atari paper came out to original, I say Atari paper, I should say, the arcade learning environment paper came out in 2012. And then in 20. 17, 2018, I think it was 2018, we had a follow-up paper where, weird paper to write. We basically sort of reviewed the literature and explained to everybody where they're doing it wrong. <laughs> That's not quite what we did. We sort of, we looked at some trends in the community and how this was being applied over the last six years that, that where we could see improvements scientifically of how we could approach this better. Um, and certainly offered up some, some new suggestions and I think those were taken. I think I think the community now could see those problems. I think I think it wasn't the right time to tell them the problems at the beginning. The right time was to let the community struggle to figure out how now. Great, we have one benchmark, but I still don't know how to compare your number to my number. And so I, I think I think that paper is certainly growing in citations. I think as it's um, doesn't rival the first paper, but it is certainly changing. I think how people use the benchmark, and I think that's been helpful. I think it shows. I think that paper was needed for the maturity of the field after this exploded. And I think it was well received because the the field was growing in maturity. So kind of given given like what you had learned over that period and now looking back, I guess 10, 11 years later, is there anything that you would have done differently to, to 2012? That's a good question. I, I think I don't I wanna say that that, you know, we we obviously did. We put out another paper to correct what had happened before that. So couldn't we have just done that to begin with? And that's a tricky question to know whether we could, right? It's, I, we're just talking about children and maybe a little bit about parenting, but like, you know, you can look back and say, I could have done something differently, but, but no, like, you know, people are changing, you know, your children are changing, their minds are developing. They might need to go through that difficult process to get to the place where something else can land that maybe that's probably still not true. That's probably still true of community of scientists. With that said, I think there is something that I learned that I think you can hard... The main thing I learned is that you should hard code in ways of working so that it's hard to do the other way. So, for example, we probably, if we wanted people to use this way of visualizing the results in the end, we should have made it so the software outputted that just automatically. You just press a button and out pops out that kind of visualization of the results rather than expecting them to take the data and do that massaging themselves. I think whatever, you know, researchers, just like most of us are, are, are lazy 
And if something, if you can give me an easy, good way of interpreting the results, I'll take that first before I think of something else. Um, you know, a secondary fact, for example, was the original Atari 2600 is a deterministic system. Um, now, we're getting into technical details, but all of our computers are deterministic systems. There's no, you know, if you ask them to produce a random number, they literally can't. Now, we have cheats for how they can produce a random number. They can they can look at things that are inherently external things that are, that are seemingly random and use that to build randomness from it. You know, much like you could take a stopwatch and like, you know, stop it and at random time and check to see, well, if it's an even tenth of a second, then I'll do one thing. And if it's an odd tenth of a second, I'll do another. Yeah, but uh, you have the same input. You yeah, know so, what you'll receive. That's right. If, it, if, if everything's happening the same, it will. And now, now once we put this in an emulator, that means it really was deterministic. There was no chance for like, you know, you could try to look for human timing between button presses or something like that to get some randomness. But now the agents are sitting there. They're controlling the second, you know, the millisecond per millisecond inputs in the system. So everything is literally deterministic in the VCS, uh, Atari 2600. You know, some people were clearly in their research were exploiting that fact in their research. Some people maybe were unintentionally exploiting that fact. And it was hard to know, right? It was hard to know if, is this learning system really just going to take advantage of that? Or is it not taking advantage of that? We don't, how would you know? We probably should have encoded in uh, a source of, of randomness. And basically what we ended up doing in the second paper was this idea that, you know, you might want to press the button on on step 312 exactly, but we are talking about tens of milliseconds, so a human can't time it that well. Like, you would see these agents would, you know, they would shoot a bullet, and then an enemy would appear from the left side of the screen, and they'd hit it. And, like, the enemy wasn't visible the, when they, they shot That's it. right. The enemy yeah. was not visible when they pressed the button. Uh, and, like, so maybe that's a good illustration of, like, what do you mean by the RL algorithms taking advantage? That's right. Yeah. yeah. So, so they could do things like, you know, whereas... You know, maybe a human could predict that. It might be predictable. At exactly one minute and 12 seconds into the game, a little UFO flies across the top of the screen, and you could time it and predict it, except for you can't, really, right? So what we ended up doing was basically just saying, when you want to take an action, um, how long you take that action for and exactly when it starts is a little bit imprecise. Uh, and then you just add a little bit of this into this, and now that's enough that the you know I can't replicate an exact trajectory uh, from before. So So... That was probably an observation we should have made from the beginning. And what we did learn about this hard-coded in was when we released the next version of the, the whole arcade learning environment package, uh, we made this the, we made the what, what got called sticky actions uh, the default. Like we made it so if you wanted to like not, or you wanted to go back to the old deterministic thing, you would have to take effort to turn that off. Uh, and I think that was like I think that also meant that immediately just the whole community just shifted to doing stochastic actions because that's just what the default was. So so realizing that defaults are really powerful on human behavior, you can go read books about this. This isn't even like break, groundbreaking, but uh, it's kind of funny that, you know, we as highly educated researchers are just as prone to these kinds of nudges. And I think I think we could have avoided maybe some of that learning, uh, that growing pains that we had with using the benchmark if we had built some defaults and nicer defaults in the beginning. With. So what are the positive things that, the benchmark has done for the RL community? Well, I think this, the single biggest one is uh, it was certainly a catalyst, exactly trying to pin down what role it played. I think catalyst is maybe the right word for what became deep reinforcement learning. Um, so deep reinforcement learning is it's just largely speaking this idea of we've already talked about the reinforcement learning problem, trying to achieve goals through learning through experience. Well, you also have this deep learning that was sort of you know, happening in the field, and, and it's maybe even harder to explain what deep learning is, but but the basic idea is how could we build more and more complicated uh, models of prediction? And mostly the deep learning work was working in the field of trying to predict something, trying to classify something, rather than trying to have a, a sequence of behavior that was effective. So, so we had these techniques that were growing in their abilities. They were looking at handwritten writing and being able to classify, but doing much fancier things than that with being able to identify you know, what objects are in an image and so on. And, you know, now largely behind uh, the, these deep learning methods are also behind much of what we're seeing in the generative language world where we're seeing chatbots that are that are very powerful now. Um, so, but at the time we had these initial models that were very powerful and we also had this idea we wanted to have behavior that achieved goals. And deep reinforcement learning was was basically just the idea of what if, what if we put them together? It's more tricky than that because how you put them together is 
neither obvious nor does every combination work. Um, and so shortly, within a few years after uh, the arcade learning environment came out, and we certainly had, I certainly had more of a role than just producing the environment because it was my, my postdoc was one of the early hires uh, in DeepMind, uh, the, the current research organization uh, with, that's part of Google. Um, but then I also had one of the grad students instrumental in the arcade learning environment, Mark Belmare. Um, both of those go to uh, DeepMind. And, you know, within, you know, before Joel Vaness, my postdoc, went to DeepMind, he even told me, hey, look, I got them to agree to let me continue working on Atari. I was like, oh, that's super cool. Uh, I had another visitor from DeepMind come and visit us six months after Joel had started. And he was talking about Atari. I was like, wait, how many people in DeepMind are working on Atari? And he was like, it's quite a bit of the company is working on Atari. I was like, okay. Um, and then, you know, sort of two years after the benchmark is released, they come out with uh, this paper called DQN or DeepQ Networks. Um, this is the beginning of deep reinforcement learning, but they combine these ideas of deep reinforcement learning uh, or, or deep learning with reinforcement learning. And they had an agent that could play all 50 of the games and really achieve what I think everyone will at least call competency, right? Their, their goal that they were trying to get to was to sort of beat human level of this game, but that's very, very debatable what that even means. But I think it was very clear that they were demonstrating what that initial goal was, was competency and doing it straight from interacting with images. And that was so far into the future, I think at the time that Atari was pitched, it grabbed the world's attention. Uh, it grabbed Google's attention. It was not long after that before Google acquired uh, DeepMind as a company and, and sort of deep reinforcement learning exploded from that. And we went from workshops at NeurIPS where there's 30 reinforcement learning researchers into it to a workshop where there's a thousand reinforcement learning researchers in it. You know, that's probably the single biggest outcome is I don't know without the benchmark, without here's, here's showing a clearly where you need vision, you need to interpret images. Uh, it's very complex that you, I think it was the ideal world to show off the marriage of, of deep learning and, and RL. Um, and it's, it's unclear that it would have gotten all the attention without having this visceral demo of it. So we, we might be in a very different environment if it hadn't been for... Yeah, I, I, I mean, yeah, I, I, I don't know. It's, it's hard to guess the counterfactuals of how things would go. Um, I would like to think that, you know, that idea still would find its way to come together, but, you know, exactly what would affect that would have happened, how it would have come about differently or, or how the field would have grown differently is hard to know. Okay, so what's next? Do we need more video game benchmarks? Is that your next task? <laughs> um, I mean, I got... You know, I helped popularize doing AI in poker, and that made that made a uh, there was a whole slew of papers and results that really drove the field forward with poker. I did the same thing with Atari. I would get this question asked a lot shortly, you know, uh, in 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 five or six years ago, uh, and I did do another one. We uh, we posed uh, the benchmark of a, the Hanabi learning environment, um, which went back to a particular game again rather than a, a swath of games. And I think I think that actually drove really interesting research as well too. So, so I think there is still a realm for where games uh, can help crystallize problems, right? So poker crystallized the problem of not knowing all the information you need to make a decision. Atari crystallized the problem of what if I really do care about my performance across a swath of domains that are all different, um, but I cannot, you know, it is not the case that the practitioner can come in and you know, set up the inputs exactly the way you want them. You have to deal with the visual inputs the way they are. Uh, and Hanabi was really about how do we build systems that can cooperate with other agents? Um, I, th I felt like there was a lot of work being done on, you know, you're going to play against somebody who's trying to defeat you. And I, I wanted to think about how do you reason about working with somebody? Um, and that's, and again, there was a game that crystallized that. So, so why is it, so why does this keep happening? Like, of course, the goal, I, I said this at the beginning, the goal was never we want to build AI or machines that can play these games. What is it that we want to do? I think we just want, we want to advance AI and the ways that we want to see them operating in the world. But the world is just so, the real world is just so messy, right? It's so difficult to know whether you made an advance in it. There's no one coming out. I mean, I think we all realize this, right? It would be really nice to have someone give us a score, like... Like on a day-to-day -day basis, here's here's how well you did today. But that that you don't get that right. Uh, maybe in maybe in school you got a grade, but that's still that was still like if you think about it, it's still super long, right? You got it at the end of the term, and if someone was reminding you of what the habits you were building beforehand, we'd probably be way better off. But but that's what this is doing: is it's saying, 
you know, as the way research works is we have ideas and we iterate on them. It's the way any, any, any good progress is made. You, you try to, you try to progressively make things better and better and better. And to have that, you need a signal and the, you know, the problems we care about, um, you know, the signal is either not there or it would be unconscionable to measure it is another possibility, right? Like, you know, there's, there's a, you know, Amy has a great deal of medical research that we're doing and which is a wonderful application of this AI technology, but you can't do the same kind of iteration and, uh, and, you know, sort of, uh, trial and error, uh, learning that you might do in playing a game of pitfall where, um, you know, the consequences are much greater. So I think games have this, there's a clear score. The consequences are not, are, are, are non-existent essentially there. You can, you can try stuff out on them both as a researcher. So are, so can our agents, our agents can try stuff out on them. That means it's not clear to me that games are really ever going to go away from the AI research. I sort of liken it to, you know, even as our, we, even as we as humans have, really grown to, to, to care about really grandiose things. Where do we start our, our, our children on? We start them playing games. We don't start them on, ultimately, you're going to be a brain surgeon, so let me get you uh, doing some brain surgery right away. There's a scalpel. Yeah. I mean, I guess we have them play Operation, but it's still slightly different. <laughs> um, so I, I think games aren't, aren't going to go away. With that said, I think you know we're already seeing the applications of much of this technology being rolled out in, in impactful ways that do uh, change the world. I think of things like one of the more recent algorithms, I, I say more recent, but it's, it's three or four years old now, uh, in the deep RL space that first showed its uh, its abilities on um, Atari was MuZero, which is uh, this model-based reinforcement learning algorithm. But it, it's being used in many industrial applications of saying, you know, how do I optimize uh, water cooling uh, or, or, or heat cooling inside of a data center? so that we could use less energy, so that we could have less of an impact on our climate. There is many opportunities to try to build efficiencies into systems where maybe in these domains, there is happens to be a clear sort of number that you might want to optimize. And yep, we can bring in practitioners to help it safeguard it so the trial and error isn't too problematic and be able to show sort of uh, better control of processes that you know, matter to us and our long-term impact on our environment and, and how efficient we are. Well. Thank you for taking the time to talk to us. Yeah, this is fun. Uh, in, the, in the interest of saying a number, I'm going to say this was 100. <laughs> so if you want to turn that up. <laughs> I hope it's out of 100 and yeah, then I'll feel well, really good. And if it's yeah. out of 1,000, I need to work on getting a higher score. We'll go with yeah, out of 100. That <laughs> you'll, you'll have to come back. Yeah. Come back and see if you can make okay, the number so higher. Okay, well, so let's say 99 <laughs> so you get something to shoot for. Yeah, I mean, I do want to try to make sure that my number's higher than somebody else's <laughs> number. <so. laughs> well, you're the highest number so far. So <laughs> Perfect. I got go. the high score. <laughs> do I get to put in my little highest initials? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, it's been it's been great kind of learning about how this, this works. So we really appreciate you coming down and, and talking with us. Thanks. Yeah.